As I was preparing this uh, message this morning, I learned about a testimony that reinforces uh, much of what I'm going to be teaching about the next couple Sundays with regards to the gift of prophecy. I felt like it fits much better next week, so um, I'm just kind of whetting your appetite a little bit. There's going to be a testimony from um, a long time, uh, one of my favorite congregants, uh, Kathy Cotter, and she's going to be sharing her a little bit of her testimony, and then I'm going to be kind of reinforcing what she shares through the rest of my teaching next Sunday. So I uh, really encourage you to make sure that you come out next Sunday and don't skip it, because if you skip it, you're going to miss it. So, all right, let's uh, pray. Thank you, Father. Lord, we just, we just thank you for your presence in this place. You know, it's kind of like coming to a, a five-course meal. Um, I was going to call this the main course, but it's really not the main course. It's more like a tasting menu when you show up here. There's such rich teaching um, even before the preacher gets up to preach. So, Lord, I thank you for the gifts, the, and not just the gifts, the, the mature using of those gifts and the maturity that we see in the leaders that we have here at Bethel. Lord, I thank you for um, the openness that you create in this space to allow you to do your thing. I think there are so many, so many places that that handcuff the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we don't do that here. We say, have your way. Manifest in whatever way you desire to manifest. Lord, we, we want things done in decency and in order, but we're not afraid of you. We're not afraid of what you may do in this service. So Lord, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray that you would move today. Lord, I just pray over this, this teaching that they would be your words, and that these words would go forth and transform minds and hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. So, have you ever been in like a crowd of people and had this random thought, thought and you get this silly grin on your face? Have you ever had that happen to you and then people look at you, it's like, why do you have the silly grin on your face? It's like, no, nobody said anything funny. Well, this happened to me. Um, the other day, but I was alone in the room, so nobody observed it. <laughs> but I, I just kind of had this random thought, and I was thinking, that, remember I mentioned this cessationist conference that's coming up this year? And I had, this, I had this random thought, and I thought, they're having a whole conference on what God is not doing in the earth today. And I just thought that was kind of funny. Totally unrelated to what I'm speaking about, but I thought that was funny. Did that go over some of your heads? I mean, oh, well, well, I will have to meet later. You can ask me about it. Anyhow, um, I uh, talked about four lists of gifts that are recorded in Scripture, and there are more lists than that, but four lists that I'm going to be focusing on for the next, I don't know how many weeks, on the gifts of the, gifts of the Holy Spirit. Um, one of the more prominent gifts, I think, in this house is the prophetic gifting. I mean, we are a prophetic house. You can see it all through the service, all through worship. We have prophetic words. Um, I believe a lot of the preaching done here is prophetic preaching, as in the Holy Spirit just kind of breathes on it, sometimes gives us themes or, or passages of Scripture, because the Lord is interested in talking to us, communicating to us, and directing, directing us. We get our primary direction and guidance through Scripture, but God's still busy speaking to His children. Amen? So this is, a, this is an incredibly prophetic house, and I think that's why I wanted to start with this gifting, that reason and this other reason. Paul gives more direction on the use of this gifting than any other gift of the Spirit in the New Testament, and he gives a lot of training and, and teaching and guidance as to how to operate in the prophetic gifting, and he says every believer should desire the prophetic gifting. In other words, every believer, that, that gift is within you, and it needs to get out of you. So I figured I, I'm going to talk about this gift first. Um, I started out with a couple passages of Scripture, one in Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. I have a lot of Scripture verse. I want the Bible to teach us this morning. All right? I'm okay with commentary, and that's what preachers do. They give commentary, they give illustrations. But there's a lot of Scripture this morning 
because I want the scripture to teach us this morning. I'm going to reinforce it with some illustrations, but a lot of scripture, so I'm going to be pounding through this pretty quickly. Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, it says, So Christ himself gave the, gave the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in faith in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. God gives us these five personalities, these, these five what I believe, leadership roles to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And much of that equipping is teaching them how to use the gifts of the Spirit. There's a lot of direction on how to use it, and I think sometimes when you don't give the direction, the guide rails or guard rails for the gifts of the Spirit, that's when things get weird, and there's criticism by other groups about that. And we need to listen to those criticisms, because without those guard rails, you can have chaos. You miss the timing of the Lord. So it's important to uh, listen to Paul's direction through the power of the Holy Spirit on how to use these gifts. Then the second passage, which I'm not going to read all the way through, is in 1 Corinthians 12. It gives a list of the gifts, what we call the gifts of the Spirit. And uh, six on that list is the gift of prophecy. So that's what I'm going to focus on this morning. So what is a prophet or what is prophecy? I have probably read more books on this specific gift than any other gift. Um, I've read a mountain of them, and I decided, you know what? I'm not going to go back and look at my highlights in those books. I'm just going to look in Scripture. And I'm glad that I did because there's some things that the Lord showed me that I would have missed. Um, but let me define what a prophet or prophecy is. There's two Hebrew words for prophet. One is, again, I'm terrible at my Hebrew, but... It's Nabi, N-A-B-I, and it actually means to be a spokesperson. That's what a prophet is in uh, the Hebrew context. There's also another Hebrew word, which I'm not going to try to pronounce because I have no idea how to do it. It's R-O with a hyphen E-H, and it literally means a seer or one who sees. So a seer, S-E-E-R. There's a, a Greek word where we get the word prophet from called prophet prophetess, I don't know if it's pronounced that way, but it's spelled P-R-O-F-E-T-E-S, and it means one who speaks forth. So these are biblical definitions of what a prophet is. So if we look in the Old Testament, it seems like prophecy is a, is a little bit different in, in the, Old, the Old Testament, but the reason why I wanted to start and just focus on what the, the Old Testament context, because I think people have this idea that there's a big difference between Old Testament prophets and New Testament prophets. I want to dismantle that a little bit. There's really not that much of a difference. And there's, it's also communicated that there seems to be a, a different, different level of authority and different consequences to prophets in the old versus the new. And I want to dismantle that idea also. So that's what I'm going to spend some time just focusing on Old Testament prophets, some specific things about Old Testament prophets because there's no way that you can share one message to talk about Old Testament prophets. So I had to narrow in and focus on something that I feel is important for us to understand this morning. So uh, a prophet foretells the future if God gives him or her a prophecy. Another thing that a prophet does is speak God's truth and give guidance to his children. We see that all through the Old Testament, that God raised up specific prophets to guide his nation and to speak forth his voice. Uh, by the way, I want to point out that this was not his original intent. Just like he wanted a nation of priests, he wanted a nation of prophets. But man in his weakness, you know, they want, we want a man to lead us. Well, they wanted, they wanted a, a priest or a king to lead them. It was the same thing with the prophets. So God... Raised up, uh, raised up prophets to guide his children and uh, to, to speak to his various leaders that, that guided the Israel really to the journey of the promised land. Um, in Scripture, sometimes prophecies are literal and other times they're more cryptic. When you read Old Testament prophecies, most of them are very literal. They're talking about nations that are threatening Israel. This is how you defeat them. They're specific and literal, but there are some that are really cryptic, and you need the discerning of the Holy Spirit to understand, you know, what they what they mean. And and I 
certainly with the messianic prophecies they they were prophecies you know that prophesied of the of the coming messiah so they were long time in the future from when they were actually actually given you know some of those probably would have been more more cryptic to them but uh, most of the prophecies throughout the old testament are are literal um, the prophet is someone who speaks for another foresees the future or proclaims a message um, I would also like to point out the majority of the Old Testament and New Testament happen to be written by prophets. Now, you can say to some extent that Scripture is prophecy, but it's more than prophecy, and it's a little different from prophecy, and I'm going to show you that. Scripture is authoritative. It's infallible. Scripture was God-breathed, so it's different than prophecies that we read in Scripture um, that are recorded in Scripture. Scripture is God-breathed. It's a different method, I believe, than what he's given prophets to prophesy. Um, so it's, it's different, but it is interesting to note that much of the Old and New Testament, because Paul was called a prophet, and the majority of the New Testament is Paul's letters to the churches, and he was called a prophet. And uh, he, he, so he wrote most of the uh, New Testament. John the Revelator was a prophet. Um, so I want to talk about the, the difference between Old Testament and New Testament prophets, and again, I'm going to focus on Old Testament this morning. Um, so the Hebrew prophets primarily anticipated the punishment of evil or a better life on earth to faithful Israelites. They spoke the truth about the present and, that, and what would happen if the people did not change their behavior and return to Yahweh's ways. When Hebrew prophets did focus on the future, they usually were concerned with the short-term future. You know, often these prophecies were related to nations that would want, want to rise up against them. And the prophet would prophesy, this nation is going to rise up against you. Serve me, worship the one true God, and I'll rescue you. And often God would rescue them. Uh, many times, which is perplexing to me, the prophet would give a specific prophecy. Israel would totally ignore the prophecy and it would be to their demise, and, and nations would come up against them. Um, there are some Old Testament guidelines for prophecy, and much of my message today and tomorrow, or next Sunday are going to be with regards to the guidelines, these guardrails that are put around prophecy, and the use of it and how to deal with what, what is called false prophet. And when I mention that, that phrase, false prophet, there's all different sorts of ideas of how to define what a false prophet is. So I'm going to clearly define that using scripture, what a false prophet is. Because there's a lot of people out there today that, you know, that are calling people false prophets, which is kind of interesting to me because this group of people that is pointing out, you know, false prophets all the time, they don't even believe in the gift of prophecy. So basically, any, anybody who prophesies is a false prophet. So really, there is, there's no other category in their mind. So everybody who prophesies is a false prophet. Um, the first passage I want to read is in Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 22, and I'm going to take the time to read all these verses. Some I'm just going to highlight and skip over, and others I'm going to read uh, the whole scripture because it's important. So Deuteronomy 15, 22. The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from the Israelites. You must listen to him. For this is what you asked of the Lord at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire anymore, or we will die. Because the Israelites, God wanted to speak to them directly. The Israelites were fearful of that, so they wanted a man to, to, to mediate for them. That was never God's original intent. But, you know, God is incredibly patient with his kids. You know, sometimes he'll, he'll, he'll relent and he'll provide another way because his heart is always to, to redeem and restore. So the Lord said to me, what they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among the fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. So a prophet is someone who's, you know, the very words of God are put in their mouth. He will tell everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words, and the prophet speaks in my name. So the prophet speaks in the name of the Lord. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything that I have not commanded, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, is to be put to death. 
And I think after somebody reads that, basically they're thinking, well, if the prophet screws up and gets a word wrong, they're a false prophet and God's going to kill them. I'm going to show you that's not the case, even with Old Testament prophets. You may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message is not spoken by the Lord? If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is the message the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously, do not be alarmed. So, uh, Father God desires to raise up a nation of priests and a nation of prophets. Israel didn't want that, so God raised up men and women to be prophets and prophetess, to, to speak his will to the people. God's desire was to do this directly with the people, but again, that's not the way it went because, you know, sometimes we just don't see things clearly. God said to himself, I'm going to put words in the mouths of the prophets. This is how I'm going to guide my children. The prophet who speaks anything that the Lord did not direct them to speak about would actually be put to death. Many of them were stoned, or God just actually took care of him himself and just kind of burned him up. Um, God here anticipates this, this question. How can we know when a message has been not spoken of the Lord? If what a prophet, he said, if what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken, and that promise, and that prophet has spoken presumptuously. That's a key word. Pay attention to that. Do not be alarmed. So because of this passage, many think that Old Testament prophets had to be infallible. That's why they, they draw this, this line. There's a, very, there's, there's a big difference between Old Testament prophets and New Testament prophets. I don't see that. I'm going to show you that this morning. They, they did not have to be infallible. God wasn't concerned that, that every word of their word that they spoke was perfect. So if they're not infallible, they need to be put to death. I want to read a companion passage in uh, Deuteronomy. I've entitled this, Arguments Against the Infallibility of True, false, or True Prophets. Deuteronomy 3, 1 through 5. If a prophet or one foretells by dreams appears among you and announces you to announces to you a sign or a wonder, and if the sign or the wonder takes place, and the prophet says, let us follow other gods, gods you have not known, and let us worship them, you must not listen to the words of the prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. I'm going to read this again. If a prophet or one who foretells dreams appears among you and announces you to a sign or wonder, and if the sign or wonder spoken of takes place, but the prophet says, let us follow other gods, this is the prophet that you need to be concerned about. So here we have this, what would be called a false prophet, giving an accurate prophecy. And God is actually using this false prophet to test his children. Now, He's not saying that that false prophet is a true prophet, but if the only, the only way to tell a, a true prophet is by an accurate word, then you're going to be a little bit confused here because this is a false prophet giving an accurate word and God is using him to, to, test, to test his people. So this passage, along with the previous passage, seems to be more concerned about whether the prophet leads them after other gods rather than the infallibility of the actual prophecies given. God is describing actual prophets who deliver an accurate prophecy but have a heart to lead the people after other gods. That's the primary thing that God was concerned about with, with regards to prophecy. It wasn't whether you should take everything that they say literally or that some of their words didn't fall to the ground or weren't perfect, or actually, I'm going to show you, were not accurate. He was more concerned about the heart of the prophet leading his people astray. That, he determined, was a false prophet, and that false prophet had to be taken out. And sometimes God didn't use people to do that. He just did it himself. God is declaring that actual false prophets whom deliver accurate prophecies but have a heart to lead God's people astray are the ones that he's concerned about. Now, it does suggest here that these false prophets are being used by God to test his people. 
But it is also clear that the test of a false prophet is not only the inaccuracy or the infallibility of their words, but by the fruit of their words. This is important with regards to prophecy. What's the fruit? This is one of the ways that Paul directed you can tell whether a prophecy is good or true or that you should stick to it or pray about it. What is the fruit of the prophecy? If the fruit is leading you astray or leading people astray, then, then you throw that away. And that would be considered a false prophet or a wrong prophecy, not necessarily just a false prophet. This does not necessarily prove the necessary infallibility of the spoken words of God's true prophets, but it does emphasize that God was most concerned, what God was most concerned about was whether these words or prophets were leading his people astray. And that's the thing that we need to be most concerned about, even with prophecy today. We're a prophetic house, so we're listening to prophets all the time. But we need to discern whether they're accurate prophecies. And we just can't assume that, that prophets that we follow are always going to give accurate prophecy. Paul would say, test them. We're going to talk more about that next week. But we need to be diligent about testing them, because I think sometimes... You know, some of these arguments by people that don't believe in the gift of prophecy is because we don't test prophecy and we just believe everything that's said. Because, well, this prophet's in my stream. You know, we've always respected this prophet, so they don't test the prophecy. The prophecy is given, it's a specific one, a literal, literal one, and the prophecy doesn't take place. We need, depending on the, the, the exposure of those prophets, I think they need to be accountable to those prophetic words. I think they need to apologize. I think that they need to say, well, I was wrong there, or I erred there, you know, I apologize. And, and many of the prophets over the past four years have actually publicly apologized. Those are not, I would not consider false prophets, but their, but their words were inaccurate because they're human. You know, this, this, whole, this whole idea of, you know, just targeting prophets, well, they, they have to be perfect. None of their words can fall to the ground. Yet they don't hold preachers or teachers in the, in, with the same requirements. If you're going to require that of prophets, shouldn't you require that of preachers and teachers? I mean, you think that everything that I share up here is perfectly accurate? Most of it is. <laughs> but I've told you many times, don't believe me, search it out yourself. But this is why I believe that when I get up here and preach, it needs to be mostly Scripture and less of me. Because I trust the Scripture to guide you and the Holy Spirit to guide you. I can, I'm, I'm just one of those signposts that point you in the right direction. I believe the Lord gives me specific words and specific things to preach on. I'm pretty confident of those. And I think the fruit bears witness to that. You know, but you know, I'm not God. And my words are failable. They're imperfect. So here are some biblical proofs, some proof texts that prophets are not always infallible. And these are like big-name prophets. And I want to show you where they missed it, and God didn't take them out. Um, this is in 2 Kings 21-6, through 6, and I love this passage of Scripture. And, and this passage of Scripture has other theological implications, which we're not going to get into. You know, but I, I subtitled this above, my, above the Scripture verse, God Changes His Mind. God can change his mind, and he does it all through the Old Testament, and God still does it. You know, especially when his people pray, get on their knees, and they repent, God relents. God decides to change his direction because people did what they were supposed to do and repent. This passage of Scripture shows this. In 2 Kings 21-6, through 6, it says, In those days Hezekiah, who was one of the good kings, became ill. Not a perfect king, but a good one. And was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, this is Isaiah, it's a big prophet, big name prophet, son of Am Amaz, Amaz, went to him and said, this is what the Lord says, put your house in order because you're going to die, you will not recover. This is the prophet's words, speaking for God. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, remember Lord, I have walked before you faithfully and with whole heart of devotion and have done what is good in your eyes, and Hezekiah wept bitterly. I, I'm just kind of picturing this, and it's, I'm sure it's not a whine because, because the Lord answered his prayer, but it kind of sounds, I mean, this is, God's pronouncing the guy's going to die, all right? I mean, that would make anybody upset. So he's pleading with the Lord, 
Before Isaiah had left the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him. Go back and tell Hezekiah, the ruler of my people, this is what the Lord, the God of your father David says, I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you. On the third day from now, you will go up to the temple of the Lord, and I will add 15 years to your life, and I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for my sake and for the sake of my servant, David. Now, either Isaiah missed it, and he didn't hear from the Lord, but Scripture, when prophets do this, I think the Lord makes that pretty clear. I don't think he missed it. This is what the Lord fully intended to do. But Hezekiah prayed, and God changed his mind. So you can't say that false prophets are anybody that, that have inaccurate prophecies, or at least it appears that they have inaccurate prophecies, because Isaiah, you'd have to lump him in that category and call him a false prophet. This is, I'm going to speak more into this next week, because I want us to have a good understanding on what to do with prophets and, and prophecies that we receive. I, I believe some of these passages are, are giving us directions. I'm kind of giving some framework, building a foundation. Um, the prophet gave an accurate word that was inspired by God, but the prophetic word didn't actually take place because Hezekiah prayed and the Lord changed his mind. So the Lord gave, gave Isaiah a different message. So the conclusion from this is prophecies are not authoritative and unchanging like Scripture is. There's this accusation that prophecies should be as accurate as Scripture, and it threatens the authority of Scripture. Prophecies are not Scripture. There's a lot of prophecies that are recorded in Scripture, but, but man is fallible. And even the Old Testament prophets, they, they were inaccurate times and they made mistakes, but, but God did not label them as false prophets, otherwise he would have put them to death. Prophecies are not fixed realities. I think sometimes prophecies are given so that God's people would pay attention to things and they would pray and the outcome or the reality would shift and change and then God would do something different. I think that we partner with prophecies that are given. I don't think just because a prophecy is given that the reality is, is, is going to be forthwith, that it's going to actually come true. And there's many examples in Scripture that that wasn't the case. I'm going to share some of them with you this morning. Prayer changes God's mind, and sometimes the outcome of decrees that are given by prophets. You know, and that is certainly the case of prophets today. You know, sometimes you say, well, that prophet got it wrong. Well, no, that's what the Lord fully intended to do, but his people prayed, God changed his mind, or we did some spiritual warfare and got rid of the demon or the principality in the area. So the reality turned out to be different. It's not that the prophet was wrong. Sometimes they are wrong. Sometimes they are inaccurate. But you've got to judge them by the fruit of the prophecy. But sometimes God relents or things happen in the spiritual realm and those, those things don't take place because we did our job. We, we took the authority that God has given us and we, we intervened. The last passage of scripture I want to read is in uh, with regards to connected to these these uh, other scripture verses in Jeremiah eighteen seven through eight. It says, "If at any time I announce that a nation or a kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation I warned repents of its evil." then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster that I planned. This is God speaking. There's this word called immutability. Well, God is immutable, and it, when it appears that, and people believe that it, when it appears that God is changing his mind, he's not really changing his mind. You know, but God is immutable or unchanging in his character. God's character doesn't change, but that does, he's, he's not unchanging as far as what he's decreed or what he's thinking. Because clearly he has, he has a relationship with people, and we can sway God's mind. That's what a father and sons and daughters do. He's called our father. And sometimes our father has decreed certain things or said, you know, I'm getting a little upset about this situation. I'm going to intervene. And we repent, and we say, you know, Dad, we're, we're, we're sorry. You know, we'd like to be involved in fixing the problem. And the father says, okay, then you try to fix it. Cooperate with me and I'll help you. 
That's what this passage of Scripture is talking about. And if another time I announce to the nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good that I intended tended to do for it. You know, so basically, this is defining the sovereignty of God, which means God can do whatever he wants when he wants. Amen? He's God. Now, here's some unfulfilled prophecy. I'm not going to read all of these verses because it would take too long, and you know, i got to end at some point. I can see some of you starting to wiggle. Just take a nap or something. This is the, the prophecy against Tyre. I've, I've been subtitled this Unfulfilled Prophecies. In Ezekiel 26, 4 through 28, again, I'm not going to read all those verses, so you can write them down and read them later. But to set the context, uh, I want, I'm going to read quite a few. So it says, they will destroy the walls of Tyre and pull down the towers. God actually used Nebuchadnezzar, was going to use Nebuchadnezzar to, to bring judgment against Tyre and the king of Tyre. So this is, this is the they that's talking, being talked about in this passage. I will scrape away her rubble, speaking of Tyre, and make her a bare rock. Out in the sea she will become a place to spread fish nets, for I have spoken, declares the sovereign God. She will become plunder to the nations, and her settlements on the mainland will be ravaged by the sword. God's bringing judgment against Tyre for their wickedness. Then they will know that I am the Lord, for this is what the sovereign Lord says. From the north I will be going to bring against Tyre Nebuchadnezzar, king of, the, king of Babylon, king of kings, with horses and chariots, with horsemen and a great army, he will ravage your settlements on the mainland and with, and with sword. He will set up a siege against you, works against you, build a ramp up to your walls, and raise his shields against you. I'm going to skip down to verse 11. The hooves of his horses will trample all your streets. He will kill your people with the sword, and your strong pillars will fall to the ground. They will plunder your wealth and loot your merchandise. And they will break down your walls and demolish your fine houses and throw your stones and timbers and rubble into the sea. Skipping down to verse 15. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to Tyre. Will not the coastlands tremble at the sound of your fall when the wounded groan and the slaughter takes place in you? Verse 17. Then they will take up a lament concerning you and say to you, how you are destroyed, city of renown, people of the men of the sea. Verse 19, this is what the Sovereign Lord says when I make you a desolate city like cities no longer inhabited. So, I mean, you're kind of getting the picture. God's going to completely demolish this city, right? I mean, that picture is clear with really specific things, and, and we can take this prophecy literal. It's not cryptic. It's not, he's not speaking in riddles. It's not like a parable. He's announcing judgment, a specific judgment against a nation, Correct. Well, look at what it says in Ezekiel 29, 17 through 20. Nebuchadnezzar's reward. It says Nebuchadnezzar is going to be rewarded for coming against the city and bringing God's judgment to the city of Tyre and the king. It says, In the 27th year, in the first month, on the first day, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, drove his army in a hard campaign against Tyre. Every head was rubbed bare and every shoulder made raw. That's an interesting phrase. I'm going to use that someday. I'm going to rub your head raw. <laughs> yeah, he and his army got no reward from the campaign. He led against Tyre. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I'm going to give you Egypt instead to Nebuchadnezzar, king of, king of Babylon, and it will carry off their wealth. He will loot and plunder the land and pay for his army. I have given him Egypt as a reward for his efforts because he and his army did it for me, declares the sovereign God. On that, on that day, I will make a horn for the Israelites and I will open, open your mouths among them. Then they will know that I am the Lord. So it's a very different outcome than that specific prophecy. That, that prophecy clearly said the king, that, that the king and Tyre was going to be basically completely destroyed, and the reward for King Nebuchadnezzar was basically what he would loot from the city. 
Often when they besieged the city, they would take slaves with them. They would take the gold and horses and animals and kill all the men, the fighting men. You know, but it clearly says that Nebuchadnezzar didn't do that. And God said, well, the reward's not going to be from Tyre. It's, I'm going to actually give you Egypt instead. It was clearly a different outcome. Um, I mean, I suppose that you can really read into that and come away saying, well, maybe I'm just not understanding it. I think it's pretty doggone clear that it seems like God changed his mind. I don't know why he did. Um, some of the other in-between chapters, you know, suggest there might have been some repentance, but for whatever reason, the sovereign God seemed to change his mind. And he actually used an, a an accurate prophet, a prophet that was not labeled as a false prophet, to give the original, to give the original word, and then it seemed to take a different direction. There was a different outcome. So here's some conclusions. Either scripture is fallible, which I certainly don't believe it is, it's God-inspired, or the Lord is comfortable with the prophecy not being fulfilled to the letter. It certainly appears to be that way, or he changed his mind. Prophecies are not authoritative and unchanging like scriptures. The authoritativeness of prophecy is not the same as scripture. It's not, and shouldn't be taken as so. Prophecies don't have to be perfectly accurate. You know, I can think of some of the prophecies that were, that were spoken over me. Some of them, I'm telling you, cryptic. It's like I had to pray for God for understanding. It's like, I, I don't understand this. They described, you know, this, you know, whatever, a lizard. No one ever gave me a prophecy like that. But I, I've received some really strange prophecies. It's like, I, don't, I have no idea what to do with this prophecy. But it, it bore witness. It was like... I think you're trying to speak to me, and I think sometimes the Lord is cryptic in prophecies like that because he's concerned about timing. He wants you to seek him. He's really concerned about you building a relationship with him and looking to him for discernment and guidance. So that drives us to God, drives us on our knees. It's like, Lord, I don't understand this. Can you show me? And sometimes I think the more cryptic the prophecy, um, the, the greater the emphasis of timing. I'm not going to give them the full understanding of this because they'll jump the gun, they'll be presumptuous, and they're not going to go in the direction that I want. You know, God's concerned about the process. You know, but this, these were not cryptic prophecies. These were, these were very specific. They didn't have the outcome that the prophet prophesied. I'm going to show you another one. In 2 Samuel 7, 1 through 5, and verses 11 through 13. After the king was settled in the palace, and the Lord had given him rest from the enemies around him, speaking of King David, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in this house of cedar, while the ark of the Lord God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it. The Lord is with you. But the night, that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says, Are, the one, are, are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? Then he goes on to say, I'm going to skip some verses, goes on to you know, commend David for all that he's done, all that he's accomplished. You know, David's faithfulness. But the Lord declares this to David. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for me in my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So we're, here we have Nathan, the prophet, confirming what David said. David said, you know, I'm in this beautiful house. God needs a house. I want to build a house. Nathan says, go for it. Now, I suppose Nathan could have been flippantly just saying that or disagreeing with the king, you know, because he didn't want conflict or something. You know, but he says, that sounds like a good thing. You know, go ahead and do that. Some people might say that that's not a prophecy, but that was a prophet, and his words carried weight. And it doesn't say that David got upset with Nathan because it seemed to be a different outcome. It doesn't say that, that you know, David put him in prison. You know, Scripture's pretty silent about it, but it seemed to have a very different outcome. Was Nathan presumptuous? Was he a false prophet? Should Nathan be put to death? Not, none of this is communicated in Scripture. Scripture is silent about it. 
David could have been upset with Nathan for misleading him. I mean, think about that. This is Nathan the prophet. You are here to guide me in the, in the word of the Lord, and it seemed like Nathan was misleading him. Yeah, it's okay. You know, you build the house. But then the Lord comes to the prophet and says, no, David's not going to build the house. I'm going to have his son build the house, build the house for me. So again, the conclusion is either the scripture is fallible or the Lord is comfortable with prophecy not being fulfilled to the letter. Prophecies, again, are not authoritative and unchanging like scripture is. There's a reason why I'm emphasizing this. We'll, you'll see this clearly next week. The Lord allows for human error among his true prophets. There are multiple other cases, which I don't have time to read, but it seems like the Lord doesn't have an issue with occasionally the prophet's words falling to the ground. Matter of fact, it seems to allude to that in 1 Samuel 3.19. It says, The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up. This is another one of those major prophets. Samuel as he grew up, and let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground, which certainly suggests that there were some words that prophets shared that fell to the ground. They were inaccurate. They weren't perfectly accurate because they were fallible men. They were imperfect men. Another passage, Romans 12, 6 through 18, gives them some guidance on prophecy. Because I, I mentioned prophecy was not always literal. It was sometimes it was dark sayings, sometimes it was riddles, sometimes it was parables. Numbers 12, 6 through 8 says, The Lord said, Listen to my words. When there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, reveal myself to them in visions. I speak to them in dreams. But this is not true for my servant Moses. He's a different sort of prophet. Pro Moses is called a prophet. This scripture is clearly saying Moses is different. He's a different sort of prophet. Moses, I speak to face to face. I have an intimate relationship with Moses. You can trust that Moses, basically, that his words aren't going to fall to the ground, not that Moses was perfect. But when it came to his prophecies, they were very accurate, and they were the words of the Lord, because Moses had this unique, intimate relationship with the Lord. We can have the same, by the way. We can start to get more accurate in our giftings the closer we draw to the Holy Spirit in intimacy with Jesus. So, with Moses, I speak face to face, and clearly not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then are you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? He was saying that some prophets speak in riddles. Sometimes it's not the prophecy that's wrong, it's our interpretation or understanding that the prophecy is wrong. We'll talk more about that next week. Moses was one of the first prophets and the Lord said, Moses, I spoke to you face to face, which means uninhibited, clear and understandable communication. There was nothing inhibiting, inhibiting the communication between, between Moses and the Lord because they met face to face. They had a special relationship. But other prophets of that day spoke in riddles, dreams, and visions. Many of the prophecies that the Lord gives me, I don't share because they are in riddles. It's like, Lord, I don't understand this. I can't even share this because it's so strange. Some, some I've actually given, you know, that are clear to me. Others, I, I, I know the Lord is giving them to me to speak to me, to, to guide me in the, the direction of what I'm supposed to teach and preach, and I'm not supposed to share them. But, but many of those prophecies are in riddles. Many of the prophecies that were given to me were not in riddles. They were clear. It's like they confirmed what the Holy Spirit was already speaking to me. Um, I'm excited to get into this next week because Paul gives us a lot of direction, guardrails on, on what to do with prophecy. I think it's going to really benefit, you're going to benefit from it. Um, I'm going to close with this about prophecy. God's word is always infallible. You can trust God's word. If there's a seemingly contradictory thing in scripture, it's you. You're interpreting it wrong, unless it's obvious. Because, see, I, I think sometimes, you know, we read Scripture with these lenses. Like, we form these doctrines, these belief systems, before we read Scripture. So we read our belief system and our doctrine into Scripture. It's a bad way to start. You know, sometimes, and, and the Lord convicted me quite a few years ago. It's like, put down the books and just read my word. 
Because sometimes commentaries and other people's thoughts, you know, can form your opinions about things in Scripture, and they're wrong. And there are many times that, I, that you know, God convicted me of things or showed me, like, a different picture. It's like, you know, you're relying too much on men, so I want you to put the books away. And some of us need to put the books away. Some of us not, need to stop listening to, you know, seven hours of prophecy every day. Because then the prophets are guiding you and the Holy Spirit isn't. Not that the prophecies are wrong, but you need to learn how to hear from God yourself. God wants to speak to you personally, wants to speak to you face to face. And I think many of us become so dependent on prophets, it's like, well, I can't hear an accurate word from the Lord, you know, unless it's from, you know, some prophet. God, God wants to meet with you face, face to face like he did with Moses. Matter of fact, things shift on, under the new covenant. There's a new intimacy that we can have that they didn't have in the Old Testament. So I think prophecy is, is quite a bit different in the New Testament in the sense God got his nation of prophets. So God's word is always infallible. The Old Testament prophets were not infallible and neither were their prophecies. But our interpretation understanding and delivery of God's word, whether through teaching, preaching, or prophetic utterances, are not infallible and should not be expected to, to, to be so. You know, if, if you're going to use this measure for a false prophet, they got to be perfectly accurate. Then I'm going to use the same measure against their preaching and teaching too. And I know that they want, don't want to be accountable for that because I, they, would, they would openly admit that my words are not infallible. So at least use the same measure if you're going to point fingers. Amen? All right. So that gives some Old Testament framework of prophecy. It's not a whole lot different than New Testament framework in guardrails, and I'll show you that next week. Let me close in prayer. Father, we thank you that you're busy still speaking to us. I mean, we thank you for your word. I mean, what you did to compile these words for us to form our Bible is incredible how you preserved it by groups of people and by individuals so that we can have the whole word of god today it's a powerful thing and we know that it's god inspired and god breathed and that it's that it's accurate but we know that we're not perfect in our understanding and interpretation of scripture so holy spirit i pray that you would breathe on us that you would continue as we search out your word and search you out, that you would give her deeper, deepest, deeper revelation of your principles, deeper revelation of your word, but more importantly, a deeper revelation of you, who you are. We love you, Lord. We love you, Father God. And we want to be obedient to you. We want to understand how to use this gift properly and, with, and in order. We just thank you, Father, for what you're teaching us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.